everyone, welcome back. Um, this is uh, our third session of the ES ESMAR conference. Um, I hope everyone's having a, a good day. Um, it's getting dark and cold here in Norway, but uh, got the fire going, it was warm. We've got a few good talks here to talk to you about quanti quantitative sy synthesis. I'm going to start off with James, who's going to tell us about synthesis of dependent effect sizes. So take us away, James. You need to unmute yourself. Is that better? Here we go. Um, I, so hello, good morning uh, from Madison, Wisconsin. I'm James Pustyowski from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Uh, I'll be talking a bit today about synthesis of dependent defect sizes using a, the combination of R packages metaphor and club sandwich. and this is joint work with my colleague Beth Tipton from Northwestern University. I've linked to, to our working paper on the topic uh, in the bottom of the title slide here. And uh, so, uh, so I'm gonna, at the end of the talk, I'm just gonna refer you all to the, to the paper for uh, much more detail than I can present here. So if you've ever done a research synthesis, uh, I'm, I, I, this, this will sound familiar. Uh, dependent effect sizes are a very, very common issue in, especially in large scale syntheses in the social sciences, also in some of the biological sciences. Um, dependent effect sizes arise for a number of reasons, including uh, if you have multiple outcomes measured on a common set of participants, if you have an outcome measured over multiple follow-up times, uh, say in a comparison of treatment and control, uh, if you have a study where there are multiple treatment groups compared to a common control condition, uh, or in correlational syntheses, if you're, if you're uh, extracting multiple correlations that are all estimated from the same sample. So doing the data extraction for this sort of uh, structure is straightforward enough. The problem is that it's often difficult to get information about the extent of dependence between the effect sizes. For example, uh, it's hard to find information about the correlation between multiple outcomes uh, estimated on the same sample. And uh, the lack of that information makes it a bit more challenging to, to do a, a defensible synthesis. One increasingly popular approach for handling uh, meta-analysis of dependent effect sizes is called robust variance estimation um, or RVE. Our, the, I, the idea of RVE is to use meta-analysis or meta-regression um, as you would normally, but to use a different method for calculating standard errors, confidence intervals, and hypothesis tests uh, using what are called sandwich formulas or sandwich estimators. Some people call them just clustered standard errors. And the advantage of using this approach is that it gives you robustness to, certain, uh, to misspecification of certain aspects of your model. You don't need to know the exact structure of the dependence between the effect sizes um, in order to be able to trust your confidence intervals and standard errors and so on. So uh, RVE, is, it's a bit like buying sort of an extra insurance policy in case some aspects of your model are imperfect or flawed. Uh, RVE uses what's called a working model. The working model describes tentative assumptions about the structure of dependence between the effect sizes say the, the degree of correlation between the effect sizes estimated from the same sample. It's called a working model because it doesn't have to be correct. Uh, that's the whole point of using RVE, but, uh, and this is, this is sort of the key point for, for what I'm gonna be presenting. Uh, using a working model that's in the ballpark, that's close to correct, is advantageous because it improves the precision of your estimates. So, you, so if you get, um, if you get a working model that's like not exactly perfect, but, but is close to right, you get smaller standard errors, right? Which is what we all want if we're, if, if we're uh, looking to draw strong inferences. The most popular implementation of robust variance estimation is uh, through the RoboMeta package. Uh, there's packages for both R and Stata. And it it's, uh, was designed by Zach Fisher, uh, Beth, Beth Tipton, and uh, Zipeng Hu. And it's, it's getting to be quite widely adopted. Um, 
the package has two built-in working models. And uh, both of those working models are limited in, in pretty important ways. So let me tell you about those. And then I'll tell you about uh, this alternative approach that gives you much more flexibility. The default working model in RoboMeta is called the correlated effects model. Uh, it is, uh, it's useful because it allows for there to be correlation between effect size estimates that are drawn from the same study. So I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but uh, I'm, I'm using a box like this to represent correlation between multiple effect size estimates. So um, that's useful because it's a very common feature of, of meta-analytic data. The, the big drawback of the correlated effects model is that um, it, it has only one random effect per study. So this amounts to assuming that all of the heterogeneity in the effect sizes exists at the study level. If you're looking at the effect sizes within a given study, there's no heterogeneity beyond what can be explained by sampling error alone. That's kind of weird, right? It's pretty limited. The other working model available in, in RoboMeta is called the hierarchical effects model. The hierarchical effects model is more flexible in that it allows for there to be heterogeneity uh, uh, within a given study. So heterogeneity at the effect size level within a study. Its main drawback is that the, the, it assumes that there's no correlation between the effect size estimates themselves. So this sort of model is appropriate if you've got for example, a, a set of studies, and each study has multiple reports, multiple samples, but, but there's only one effect size that you're using from any given sample. So that's fairly limiting, right? In practice, you often have data that has both of these structures. And if you're, if you're, uh, if you're limited to using the RoboMeta package alone, um, you have, you have, you're faced with this sort of fixed choice between alternatives, neither of which is really a, uh, the, a, an optimal structure for describing your database. So my main message today is that you don't actually have to choose between these two working models. Um, a different strategy is to use the metaphor package, which provides a very, very flexible uh, and powerful set of uh, powerful way of expressing uh, models, including multi-level models and multivariate models. And if you use the metaphor package, you can treat the, the model that comes out of that as a working model and combine it with robust variance estimation techniques. Uh, I'll demonstrate that uh, briefly here. Uh, before I get to that though, uh, um, I wanna highlight what we think, what we're starting to think of as sort of the leading candidate for a working model, if you don't, if you're unsure of which working model to try first. So we call it, um, maybe unsurprisingly, the correlated and hierarchical effects model, uh, or CHE for short. We want to get t-shirts done with like the, uh, you know, like revolutionary meta-analysis meta meta models. Um, so the, the CHE model allows for there to be correlation between the effect size estimates within a given study. So the D01, DP1, DQ1 can be correlated. It also allows for there to be within study heterogeneity in the true effects. So that's useful because uh, it lets you uh, uh, investigate or uh, probe at least tentatively the extent of within study heterogeneity rather than just assuming it away. Now, if you estimate this model in metaphor, the standard errors and tests that come out are going to be based on all of the all of the assumptions of the working model. So if the working model is misspecified in some way, um, you may not be able to trust the standard errors and confidence intervals. But you can combine this model uh, with tools from the Club Sandwich package. Club Sandwich um, is the package that I wrote that provides uh, RVE methods, so standard errors, hypothesis tests, and confidence intervals for many different types of models, including models estimated with the rma.mv function from Metaphor. So rma.mv is the main uh, multivariate, multi-level uh, estimation function in Metaphor. And one advantage of using the club sandwich package in particular for giving RVE is that in, it includes small sample corrections, which give you uh, quite accurate inferences, uh, even if the number of studies in your database is limited. 
Um, Matt, how am I doing on time? I'm sorry, I, I, my timer is off. Uh, you're getting close to the end. Okay, so um, I'm gonna uh, I'm just gonna wrap up then, and I will uh, I will post this the uh, the workflow rather than getting into rather than doing a walkthrough right now. Um, but the, so uh, very briefly, the workflow essentially involves three steps. First, expressing your assumption about the degree of correlation between the effect sizes using the impute covariance matrix function. Second estimating a working model through metaphor, and third, feeding that working model into a function from Club Sandwich. So it's, uh, it, it works fairly seamlessly. So let me sum up. Um, why use this workflow involving metaphor and Club Sandwich rather than the River Meta package? Um, the main reason is that using a better approximation to the real dependence structure, so using a model that seems to uh, be more, better describe the structure of your data, will often give you more precise estimates of average effect sizes or meta regression coefficients. And in simulation work that we're, uh, that we're doing, we're finding that the, the gains in precision can actually be quite substantial sometimes. We're talking about like standard errors that, that go from this wide to this wide, you know, uh, uh, gains of 40 to 60 or 70%. Uh, so that's, it can be quite substantial. Second, using a more flexible working model provides you a better description of, of the structure of heterogeneity. Rather than assuming away heterogeneity within, uh, at the effect size level within studies, you can explore it. That's useful diagnostically. It may also be uh, uh, interesting on a substantive level. And then finally, using RVE methods generally gives you some protection against model misspecification. So you don't have to stake everything on having exactly the right modeling assumptions. Uh, you can have some insurance or assurance uh, that, that the, the, your inferences are, are robust. So for much more detail, uh, uh, an extensive example, code demos, and some simulation evidence, uh, I would refer, to, refer you to our working paper. And I'm also happy to answer questions, uh, uh, get your feedback, and, and talk about RVE in the Slack channel. So thank you very much. Thank you, James, that was brilliant. Um, we're gonna ha have the questions at the end in, in the panel. Um, so let's move on to Maya, who's gonna talk about uh, the R package publication bias. Take it away, Maya. Okay, I should be unmuted now. Uh, great, so I will be talking about the R package publication bias, which aims to do simple sensitivity analysis for the possible impacts of publication bias. So broadly, one of the questions that this package tries to answer is how severe would publication bias have to be hypothetically in order to completely explain away the results of a meta-analysis? Uh, so here's an example of a meta-analysis where publication bias was very contentious. This looked at 75 studies on the association of playing violent video games with increased aggressive behavior. And it found a pooled correlation of about 0.16, um, so fairly small effect, but a positive uh, association of video games with aggressive behavior. And the impact of publication bias was hotly debated actually for many years on this meta-analysis with some commenters saying that this entire effect could be completely explained away by publication bias. So we're gonna try to take a look at whether that claim is plausible. The approach that this R package implements is called sensitivity analysis and it goes roughly like this. So, First, we consider a publication process in which statistically significant positive results are more likely to be published than negative or non-significant results by some unknown ratio, which we call a selection ratio. This is similar to selection models as, you're, as you'll hear in a later talk. Uh, we call statistically significant positive results affirmative and negative or non-significant results non-affirmative. So the sensitivity analyses then try to make statements of the following form. In order for publication bias to shift the observed point estimate of my meta-analysis to the null, 
it would have to be the case that affirmative results were at least, let's say, 30 times more likely to be published than negative or non-significant results. We can then think about whether that 30-fold is actually plausible or not. Maybe we think that 30-fold uh, favoring of affirmative results is too much to be plausible in practice. To put some visual intuition on this, uh, here I'm showing you a funnel plot where I've just simulated a bunch of studies prior to the introduction of publication bias. They're color-coded by affirmative results, significant and positive, versus non-affirmative results, negative or non-significant. Now, suppose I introduce publication bias with a selection ratio of 10. Uh, then essentially what happens is uh, only 10% of the non-affirmative studies survive to publication. Um, so we get kind of the thinning out of the non-affirmative studies in our observed sample. So as a brief intuition behind how the statistical methods work for sensitivity analysis, they essentially uh, try to cope with this kind of publication bias in which non-affirmative studies are underrepresented by using inverse probability weighting to upweight the non-affirmative studies that we do observe. Um, the statistical theory and precise assumptions behind how and when this works are in our statistics paper, which is cited at the end. Uh, another thing you can do is consider worst case publication bias, which is the scenario where publication essentially favors affirmative results by almost an infinite ratio over non-affirmative results. And so an estimate that is corrected for this kind of hypothetical worst case uh, publication bias arises from actually meta-analyzing only the non-affirmative studies that we observe and just throwing away the affirmative ones. Uh, so some of the reasons that we wanted to pursue this sensitivity analysis approach are to try to assume a fairly realistic model, although still simplified, um, of publication bias that selects on significance, similar to selection models, that does not assume that very large studies are, are immune to publication bias, um, that works even for small meta-analyses, um, actually using the RVE approaches that James just talked about, and that accommodates heterogeneous effect sizes without assuming that they're normally distributed. Okay, so here's the R package. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of simple analyses uh, back uh, using the video games meta-analysis. So first question we might ask is, how much publication bias would it take, hypothetically, to completely explain away this correlation of 0.16? So here I'm calling a function called s value. Uh, the arguments are, are fairly standard, so I'm giving it uh, point estimates and variances from my meta-analysis. Uh, you can also tell it if you have clusters. Um, here, I'm telling the function that I'm assuming publication bias, in this case, favors positive correlations rather than negative ones. And uh, the first two return values here, sval.s and sval.ci, are telling me that, in fact, if, if this is a plausible model of publication bias favoring affirmative results, then, in fact, no amount of publication bias of that type could entirely explain away the point estimate in the sense of attenuating it all the way to zero, uh, nor even to shift its confidence interval to include the null. So therefore, there's some sense in which this meta-analysis actually is fairly robust to publication bias. Let's dig in a little bit further and consider what happens under worst case publication bias. Again, this arises from meta-analyzing only the non-affirmative studies, but uh, the package will also return that with that same call to S value. Um, this is on the Fisher Z scale, but if we transform back to Pearson's R, uh, what we find is that under worst case publication bias, again, of this assumed type, then the pooled estimate would decrease to a correlation of about 0.08 with a confidence interval bounded above 0.05, uh, which is certainly smaller than the uncorrected estimate, which was 0.16, so about half as large. Uh, but it is still positive um, and with a confidence interval bounded above 0.05. So again, that, that is under sort of hypothetical worst case publication bias. 
Uh, more things you can do with the package include uh, considering attenuating the point estimate to some other value besides the null, um, doing bias correction for a specific speculated uh, selection ratio, um, considering other similar mechanisms of publication bias and you're visualizing you're running on time, Maya. Okay, uh, great. So I will just end with, um, there's a paper that provides empirical benchmarks to help interpret this and here are the links. Brilliant, thank you, sorry for that. Uh, no worries. So next up, uh, we've got Phil, who's gonna to talk to us about dynamic meta-analysis um, and what they've been doing um, over there. So Phil, if you're ready, you can take us away. Yeah, will do. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? Should be all right, I know. Okay. Right, so yeah, I'm Phil Martin. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Cambridge um, where I work with the conservation, conservation evidence team um, and we try to provide evidence to guide um, conservation decision-making. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about a project I've been working on um, with another postdoc called Gorm Shackelford, who's mainly led this work um, that looks at using a, a new method of meta-analysis that we call dynamic meta-analysis and how it can be useful to, for providing evidence to guide local decisions from a uh, global evidence basis. So um, just getting to the problem that we're trying to deal with, the presentation and interpretation of meta-analysis often looks a bit like this in a paper. So this is um, a meta-analysis that looked at the effects of different interventions on the abundance of different invasive plant species. Um, and so if you look at this plot, you would say that herbicide generally has the um, strongest negative effect on, on the abundance of uh, invasive plant species. But if I was looking at this from the perspective of a manager, um, uh, end user of this information, I might look at this and think that this information isn't very uh, useful to me because they don't specify what herbicides we use and also we don't know what uh, invasive species have been looked at. Um, and so I might dismiss this evidence as not being that useful for me. On the other hand, I might assume that this is really useful for me because it shows that herbicides really good at, um, at combating invasive plant species. And I might go away and spray herbicide um, on a field with an invasive species that I want to get rid of. Um, but I might end up using a herbicide that's not been included in the study in this meta-analysis. And that would result in poor transferability of the results from this meta-analysis to my context. Um, and that's really the issue we're trying to deal with. So people really want information that's relevant to their context when they're making uh, decisions. Um, and this relates to external validity. So this is when um, results of one study are, are poorly transferred to another context. And uh, the study that I cite here, the, the one that the quote is from, from Gutzat and Dorman, um, they went out and interviewed um, a bunch of uh, forest managers. And they found that one of the biggest um, barriers to uh, evidence being used in forest management was that often um, it wasn't formulated for the specific context that they were interested in. And so often they dismissed that information. And so I, in our experience at Conservation Evidence, where we work a lot with practitioners and um, people that use uh, evidence to guide management, um, a lack of relevant information from synthesis can lead to people just dismissing evidence synthesis. Um, so the things that we see people often do is that they will select one or two studies that are similar to the system in which they're working and kind of generalize from those studies, or they will go and ask their friend who works down the road, who works in a similar study system, what the results of a certain intervention were in, in their context. Um, and then they just use that instead. Um, and so this is what we're trying to, to combat. Um, so traditional meta-analysis as we view it looks a bit like this. So if, all, if you view all of the black boxes as being things that researchers do, um, they define the research question, they search the literature, um, they extract data, they analyze the data, and then they present the findings in a paper or a preprint or whatever. And then, and only then do you get some interpretation of the findings by the end users. Um, so managers or, or policymakers or, or whatever. And the way in which we view dynamic meta-analysis, which we've built a tool uh, around uh, called Metadata Set, um, we, we view it more like this. So all of the black boxes, again, are things that researchers would do. They define the research questions and search the literature and extract data. 
but we would like to bring users into some of the analysis process. Um, so we've designed the Shiny app um, to allow users to filter and recalibrate data within uh, databases, um, sorry, within meta, uh, meta analyses that we've, we've put and brought together. And then users can interpret these findings and use this to, to guide um, practice. Um, at the moment, we so we have a website, um, metadataset.com, that this is uh, all available on, um, and we have a Shiny app that we've built as well. Um, we have two systematic review topics that we've been working on, one on sustainable agriculture and one on invasive plant management. And I'm just going to go through an example from invasive plant management because that's what I've been uh, leading on um, for the last year or so. So if I put myself in the shoes of someone who wants to manage an invasive plant species, this is Japanese knotweed. It's one of the most notorious uh, invasive plant species uh, that you get in the UK. It causes widespread economic damage. Um, I might be particularly interested in spraying it with herbicide. So what I would do is, if this works, I'd go to our website, click through to the section on Japanese knotweed down here. Um, and it gives you a brief uh, description about where this information has come from can click through to a section that's called data by intervention. So this gives you all the interventions we have information on from, um, from our systematic review. And it tells you, you have things on like invasive plant management. This is all hierarchical, so you can do this at various different levels. If I click on using a herbicide or mixture of herbicides and then filter by outcome, it brings you to a summary page of showing you more or less where in the world the, this information has come from, how much data you have, and also all the different outcomes, again, organized as a hierarchy. And I'm, in this case, I'm particularly interested in plant abundance. So this is the abundance of Japanese knotweed. This launches a Shiny app. I click on Start Your Analysis. And what this does is it does a dynamic um, bespoke analysis for, for the, the outcome that I was interested in. So this gives you a, a summary paragraph saying that there was a 73% reduction in Japanese knotweed abundance. And it tells you something about the data of this. Um, is drawn from uh, this result comes from. You also have kind of summary forest plots and funnel plots if you want to play around with those um, as well. And all, yeah, all of this is dynamic. But we think the really powerful thing is that you can potentially do some filtering and exploring of um, the underlying data here. So if I was particularly interested in imazapir, which is a widely used herbicide, I can select that, rerun my analysis, and then I just get the result for that herbicide. Uh, and you can see in this case, there's an 80% reduction in, in the abundance of Japanese knotweed. And you see some summary information about the publications that um, this data came from. So that could be potentially a really powerful way of people interacting with this uh, data um, in, in new and interesting ways. Another way that we think that uh, people could use this is we've written short summaries of the methodologies and kind of context that people have um, carried these studies out in. And something that we see people complain about is things being kind of more or less relevant to the, the, the context. So what you can do is you can apply new weights. So this would be a new weight in addition to inverse variance weighting that we already use. So reducing the study relevance reduces the weight that's applied um, to a particular study um, uh, when you're producing your meta estimates. Um, so it was just a quick whistle stop door of the tool. Um, just to say we have a preprint that came out last year that was led by Gorm Shackelford, who, who, uh, who was the lead uh, postdoc on this. Um, and he has all this available on his uh, GitHub. Um, so if you want to have a look at it in more detail, uh, you can have a look at it there. We're looking to expand this tool. So it'd be really interesting to get um, people's uh, ideas. And so, yeah, what we want to do next really, and one of the reasons I really want to present um, at the conference is we want to engage with the synthesis community and get ideas about what they think uh, about this tool, whether they think it's good or bad, what they think could be um, done with it, you know, what, how we could extend it and make it better. Critically, we want to engage with practitioners, people that would actually use this. Um, and we're planning to do that and do some user testing because um, we know at the moment this tool is kind of a bare bones, quite ugly tool. Um, we want to make it more user friendly um, and prettier to look at. Um, and probably for users, much simpler. Um, we wouldn't want to provide them with so many different options. We also need to produce guidance on this to prevent people from doing things like p-hacking and you know data dredging so that they're not just coming up with the res results they want as a result of subsetting. And we also want to expand this and scale it up so we have more different meta-analysis um, 
well, more different topics that meta-analyses uh, could be done. And this would allow people to synthesize across a whole range of um, different problems in conservation that we're particularly interested in. Um, finally, I just want to say thanks to uh, my team that was involved uh, with working on this. So Gorm Shackelford, um, you can see in the Hawaiian shirt there, who basically led all of this work um, and has since moved on from Cambridge, uh, hence why I'm presenting this. Um, Bill Sutherland, my boss, uh, who's been leading uh, on supervising that work. Um, and Millie Head, who's also been working with me on this. And also the Conservation Evidence Team and the Climate Project, um, under which I'm funded, and I'm funded by the Claudia, uh, sorry, the David and Claudia Harding Foundation. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have to say. Um, thanks very much for listening, guys. And yeah, um, it'd be really interesting to get ideas about collaborations or anything like that. So if anyone wants to chat in the Slack, then I'm more than happy to. Thanks very much, Phil. That was, that was brilliant. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so the last speaker for this session, he, he's back again, is uh, Wolfgang. He's going to give us uh, some, uh, talk about selection models for publication bias. So Wolfgang, if you're ready, you can take it away. Yes, thanks. Um, so hello again, everybody. Just to clarify, I did not submit two talks. Uh, Neil asked me to give my talk on the reporter function this morning because that's something that uh, grew out of one of the evidence synthesis hackathons. So, and it fitted well with the automations part. So, but this is the talk that I actually uh, submitted and it's on selection models. So let me jump in. So when we do a meta-analysis, so we collect the studies that have examined some phenomenon of interest, let's say a treatment effect. And then we quantify that effect in terms of some kind of effect size or outcome measure. And uh, these, these values, these estimates can then be fed into, for example, a random effects model to estimate the average true effect and the variance in the true effects. Now, a special case, of course, arises if there is no variance in the true effects, then the model collapses down to a fixed effects model and we estimate the true effect. Now, a major concern in meta-analysis is publication bias. So, what we like to do is to synthesize all relevant studies on the phenomenon, but or at least a representative sample of them. But the studies that we have mostly come from the published literature. And those studies have undergone some kind of selection process. And as a result, they may no longer be representative of all of the studies that have been conducted on the phenomenon. And as a result, we may get biased estimates of the average effect or the variance in the effects. Now, to give an example of a meta-analysis where this problem may be at hand, this is a funnel plot of studies that have examined uh, lung cancer uh, risk in those exposed to environmental tobacco smoke compared to those not exposed. And here the results are quantified in terms of log odds ratios with positive values indicating a higher risk in those exposed. Now, what you may see in this funnel plot here that it's, it's not quite symmetric. So on the left-hand side, there appears to be a gap. And so this may indicate publication bias. And if so, then the estimate we get from a meta-analysis of these studies, uh, the, the estimates will be biased. Now, one way to deal with publication bias is by means of selection models. So selection models try to account for some kind of selection process that may have happened. Now, when I say selection process, I don't mean explicit selection by the person conducting the meta-analysis. I mean some implicit process by which certain types of studies are more or less likely to end up in our meta-analysis. Now, all kinds of selection models have been proposed in the literature. Here, I want to focus on selection models where the relative likelihood of selection is a function of the statistical significance or the p-value of the study. So just imagine we live in a crazy, crazy world where statistically significant studies are more likely to be published. And so then they're more likely to end up in our meta-analysis. Now that's a bit of a silly idea, but just go with that thought process. Okay, so then we have here a selection function that says that this relative likelihood of selection is a function of the p-value and some parameters here, two parameters. And this is the beta selection model 
And uh, well, let's look at some possible selection functions, what they may look like. Now, if both of these parameters are equal to one, then the selection function is flat. So there is no relationship between the p-value and this relative likelihood of selection. But in other situations, depending on these parameters, we may be in a situation where statistically significant or highly significant studies are much more likely to be selected or end up in our meta-analysis than less significant studies. Now, another group of models were suggested by Preston and colleagues. I call these exponential decay models because in all of these, except for this power function model, the relative likelihood of selection is an exponential function of the p-value. Now, these are one parameter models. And here, if this parameter is zero, then again, we get a flat selection function. But for other values of this parameter, depending on the model, we get different shapes of the selection function. Now, an extension of this is the negative exponential power selection model, which sounds pretty cool, has two parameters. And so that gives us a little bit more flexibility as to how that selection function can look like. Now, in all of these models, the selection function gives is a smooth function of the p-value. Now, there's another group of models, these step function models. And here what we do is we define some cut points and within the intervals defined by these cut points, the relative likelihood of selection is constant. Now, of course, it differs between these intervals. Now, we usually set these cut points at values that are sort of inherently interesting. So for example, at 0.05, where a significant effect turns into a non-significant one or at 0 0.5, where for one-sided p-values, the direction of the effect flips. Now, how can you fit these models? Well, there are a bunch of R packages that can do this, and I recently added the possibility to fit selection models to the metaphor package. So to illustrate this here, I'm doing the meta-analysis on this, the, uh, the data I've shown you earlier. So this is a data set that also comes with metaphor and it includes the log odds ratios and the corresponding sampling variances. Here I'm fitting a fixed effects model, storing the results in an object. And then I can feed this object to the cell model function, which can then fit the selection models like the beta selection uh, model or the step function model and several other ones. And then we can plot these selection functions and look at the results. So these are the results from a regular fixed effects model of these 37 studies. We don't have super convincing evidence of heterogeneity, at least based on the Q-test, but well, maybe we should have fitted a random effects model. You can do this as well, but here I'm just gonna stick to a fixed effects model. And so we get an estimate of the pooled log odds ratio, which is significant and uh, indicates a higher risk um, or odds in those exposed. Now, these are the results from the beta selection model. So we get estimates of these two selection parameters, and then we get an adjusted estimate of the pooled log odds ratio. And these are the results from the step function model. And so I get these estimates of the relative likelihood of selection in these different intervals. And again, an adjusted pooled estimate. So this is what all these selection functions look like. So I fitted all of them. And so some of them suggest less severe forms of selection, others quite severe forms of selection. And depending then on the model, you also get rather different adjusted estimates. So if a model estimates quite severe forms of selection, then the adjusted estimate is close to zero actually. Now this immediately raises the question, which of these models should we trust? Now, I can tell you that because really more research is needed on how to select selection models, which is a little bit like inception, but really this is still an open question. And I should also point out that fitting these models isn't easy. So you shouldn't really try this if you only have a handful of studies, especially if you're trying to do this in the context of a random effects model. So distinguishing selection effects from heterogeneity is very difficult. And so then you can run into convergence problems or other numerical issues, so be aware of this. Now I want to finish this talk with one final point, namely that hopefully in the future we won't these, need these models in the first place. 
So for example, if we would conduct a meta-analysis only based on pre-registered studies, then essentially what we are doing is minimizing or eliminating publication bias. And that is really the best way to deal with publication bias, to get rid of it. But in the meantime, maybe we can use some of these selection models to try to address potential publication bias. All right, so here are the references and my contact information. And thanks for your attention. Brilliant, thank you so much. That was great. Okay, so we've got um, about 20 minutes left of, the, left of the session. There's a couple of questions that come in, but I think um, it would be really nice if, if Julia doesn't mind, if we can go to Julia and hear her comments on, on, um, and maybe some questions she might have for, for the panels, uh, the panelists. Um, okay, um, I, uh, I have a question for Maya. Um, I, I, I really uh, was interested in your new package. I was wondering um, this sensitivity analysis, what you propose, how, uh, what are the advantages of that approach compared to other sensitivity analysis types uh, for testing publication bias like fail safe numbers or uh, fill, fill, uh, trim and fill approach, which also provides, you know, an estimate how robust your results are uh, to publication bias. Yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, and in the paper, we actually do provide a, an analog to the fail safe N. Um, so first with respect to trim and fill, um, I mean, I think these methods are all complementary, but one thing that we wanted to try to change about that is to assume a model of publication bias that is more like selection models where the selection is uh, explicitly based on statistical significance rather than on uh, sort of the size of a study's point estimate. We felt that that conforms better to kind of what we know empirically about how publication bias operates. Um, with respect to the fail-safe N, it, it is similar in, uh, in flavor in that it's saying sort of how bad would publication bias have to be. The difference is that rather than postulating that there's some, uh, some group of studies that are unpublished, all of which have one particular mean like zero or some other chosen value, um, rather it's, it's still operating in the selection model framework where the unobserved studies, rather than all having the same mean, for instance, what they have in common is that they're representative of the non-affirmative studies as a uh, sort of heterogeneous population. Okay, thank you very much. And, and then I had a question for Phil as well about the dynamic meta-analysis. Um, I, I really like sort of the, the technical aspects of it and how the, the interface and what you can look at with different combinations and play with the data. I'm a bit less comfortable about making this interface available for uh, users rather than used by uh, research synthesists who are aware of problems of bias and you know the um, interpretation of the data. For instance, you talked about the fact that users will be able to do funnel plot or forest plot. I don't think uh, like conservation managers necessarily equipped with knowledge to interpret these tools. And so I'm a bit worried about uh, possibility that this might kind of introduce more bias if they start playing with the data, excluding studies they don't like or downgrading, downweighing the studies what they don't like. And I was wondering whether you could comment on sort of alternative approach to that um, when you showed this kind of process of meta-analysis and suggesting to bring uh, end users um, sort of more towards the end or second half of the process as opposed to bringing them from the very beginning. So when they are involved in formulating the question to begin with, so what this question has absolutely relevance to them. And then they can also say um, about the specific in inclusion criteria, for instance, which will make sure what the results of that research synthesis will be of value to them rather than something, you know, global synthesis, which will produce this big uh, overall effect, which might be of no relevance, obviously, to a particular question. So maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, so I guess I guess there's two two parts to that question. One is, do they have the technical ability to do the meta-analyses in the way that I was kind of playing around with? And the second one is, yeah, what should we be engaging them earlier? Um, so yeah, the first one, we don't really envisage the tool as it is to be useful for practitioners. Um, we think it is 
way too complex. It has too much going on. And yeah, I, I completely agree. I, there's lots of conservation scientists that would look at a funnel plot, people that I work with, that wouldn't know what they're looking at. So to expect a manager who, or you know, a, a manager's manager to kind of um, to interpret these plots is is probably a bit crazy. Um, we we kind of envisaged maybe two flavors of this tool so there might be a tool that you know a version of the shiny app that would be useful for researchers that they could play around with the data and do something with it um and they can download the csvs and do all sorts of analysis um that they would want to do but we were envisaging maybe a simpler version of this tool as well um that would provide very basic statistics on um outcomes for for particular interventions um for for you know policy and and, and practice um the other side of it is, so the the other comment that you made about when do we in, involve end users um i completely agree with you that you, you should have key stakeholders and uh, key stakeholders involved at the beginning however um the way in which we're working in conservation evidence and i know you i mean we've had conversations with you about this um, that we try to do synthesis in a very large scale way. So we we don't do systematic reviews a lot of the time. So I, the work that I've been doing has been based on systematic reviews, but the other stream of work that people work on at Conservation Evidence is probably not quite as robust as, as systematic reviews. Um, but the advantage it does have is it covers a huge amount of ground. Um, and we see that there's a real advantage in just having data sitting there so that when people want the question answering, there's, they can answer the question. Um, because what we find with policy relevant stuff is there's a really, like people want the answer now, right? They, they want the answer in a really short part, time period and managers want to know by next week what their, you know, what the interventions that they should be using are. They don't want to wait a year and a half for me to do a systematic review to do it. Um, so I think, I, I completely agree that you should bring um, people in early, but I think there's also value in the other approach as well. Um, that just having data sitting there that can be queried could be really powerful um, if it's done in the right way. And we have to work on how we do that because yeah, I, I mentioned that we need to come up with guidance and, and ways in, in which we can make people make um, sensible decisions. Yeah. I hope that answered your questions. Yes, thank you, Phil. Okay, Matt, maybe you can ask questions what you have from the audience. <laughs> yeah. You're muted. You're still muted, Matt. <laughs> I'm still muted. There you go. Now you should be able to hear me. Uh, James, you had a question for Phil, I think. Um, do you want to ask him that? Oh, so uh, it was along really similar lines to, to, uh, to Julia's question. Just curious about who, uh, who you envision as the end user base and, and whether they have whether they're going to have like the requisite uh, expertise to do things like interpret final plots and public. Yeah. It's, so yeah, I, I kind of mentioned with, uh, with my yeah. answer to Julia's question, but um, yeah, as it stands, I think the answer is no. I don't think I don't, don't think we would have we we would envisage this uh, being used by not people that work directly in the field necessarily in conservation, but you know, kind of managers of, of um, reserves and things like that. So people that are kind of dealing with the logistics of management um, and drawing up management plans and things like that. Um, yeah, and but we wouldn't envision them having the technical ability to interpret funnel plots. Um, we really should put that in as an added extra to for researchers to have a play around with. But as, as I said before to Julia, we probably would come up with a different flavor of this to be used by managers. And that's why we need to do user testing because this is just too complex at the moment. Okay, does that answer your question, James? Cool. Um, so there's a couple of other questions that come in um, in no particular order, but uh, let's start with, there's one from Maya, uh, from Emily. Uh, would, uh, she would be cu curious to hear how the package might differentiate between publication bias and lots of heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so one thing that's different about the sensitivity analysis approach rather than methods that try to actually estimate the severity of publication bias, like selection models, for instance, is that the latter, the estimation approaches really do have that, that struggle where they have to try to sort of parse heterogeneity from publication bias. And that 
that is kind of where those parametric assumptions about, for instance, normally distributed effects come in, because you're absolutely right that uh, if you give me an effect distribution that I've seen in a published sample, I can always explain it, but it's, it's under identified. I can always explain it by some combination of heterogeneity and publication bias. So um, the sensitivity analysis approach by not trying to actually estimate publication bias, which is a limitation, um, but by not trying to do that, it, it doesn't really have to separate those sources, but rather just um, upweight the non-affirmative studies that we see by some ratio. And so, uh, so it doesn't actually have to try to uh, figure out which parts of the heterogeneity are publication bias versus uh, real. Thank you. Um, so on the same, uh, uh, no, sorry, let's just give it a, a question for Wolfgang, There's one from uh, Matt Jones. Uh, and his question is, is there bias in who pre-registers pre their studies? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm sure there is. Um, people who care about open science pre-register their studies. Um, and uh, well, those people may be different than people who do not do that. Will that lead to, well, so I think my answer to this is if you pre-register your study, you are just eliminating the potential for certain selection effects basically, right? So, I mean, you can still, you can pre-register your study and still do all kinds of, um, things you shouldn't be doing, but well, then at least you will get caught or you're more <laughs> likely to get caught. So um, yeah, of course, people who do pre-registration are different, um, but the whole point is just to eliminate or reduce at least to a large extent certain selection effects. That's the whole, that's well, at least part of the idea of doing pre-registration. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for you here, James. Um, again, from Emily. She'd be curious to know um, about how to plan or handle meta-regression analysis in the metaphor and club sandwich option. Um, how many papers are needed to meet the assumptions and identify significant moderators? Yeah, uh, oh, great question, Emily. So the, uh, our working paper um, addresses this a bit. We give a, uh, at least our sort of tentative um, uh, suggestions for uh, in the form of a flowchart for how you might plan to select a working model and uh, and then use this combination of metaphor and club sandwich. Um, there's, there's, though there's definitely more work to, to refine that and, and get at uh, sort of sample so minimum sample size requirements and things like that. Um, the one sort of broad thing you can say is for, uh, for a model like the CHE that has two random effects in it, the, the sample size requirement might be quite modest. Um, for more uh, complicated models like a multivariate model, um, you, you, there, there will definitely be um, larger samples needed and the samples need to have a certain structure to them as well. Um, and, and then finally, uh, in terms of power, uh, the, um, we're, we're working on it. Um, we're, I've got a project going to, uh, to uh, try to provide guidance about, about uh, the number of studies needed to achieve a given level of power for, um, for simple models, like in just an overall average effect or um, a contrast between two study level moderators. In the meantime, um, if you're comfortable with simulation, you can always simulate power. Um, yeah, um, I hope that answers uh, the, the query. Thank you very much. Um, have any of the panelists got any, any questions for each other um, you'd like to ask? Um, I, I just put one in the chat for Maya, which is, so the, uh, Maya, you know, your package currently uses RoboMeta. Um, yeah, so do you think it would be, are, are, there, are there roadblocks or is there a reason to avoid using a multi-level or multivariate uh, framework for, for a synthesis under the uh, under this sort of selection sensitivity model? 
Yeah, so I think that would work using an approach like yours where you also tack on those robust um, standard errors, but uh, because it's using those inverse probability weights, so it's it's tweaking the study weights to be not only the inverse variance, but also multiply that with the inverse selection ratio for each study. And so uh, the introduction of those um, would, I mean, you, you could kind of modify a likelihood-based approach, but the introduction of those uh, that additional portion of the weight. Um, so far, we're, we're, we've been dealing with uh, using RVE, but I think you probably could, um, you, you certainly could extend it to a likelihood-based approach and then kind of add in uh, parametric assumptions as well. Okay, um, so we've, we've answered, I think, most of the questions on the, the, are on the Slack uh, coming through. Remember, you can still ask questions of the of the presenters, and um, hopefully they can um, answer them at some point. Um, so there's no rush. The Slack will be there for a while. Um, any last comments from the panelists? No. Nope. Okay. So um, we're going to reconvene in uh, I think uh, in half an hour. No, 15 minutes. I can't look it out with time. My my time differences are lost in my head somewhere. Uh, but, but soon, Neil will be able to put, tell us when. No, uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Um, so that's just to say thank you to all the panelists. Thank you very much for a really interesting uh, discussion. Um, and I hope to see you 